I've briefly talked about how joining a big tech company is a great career move, especially if you're early on in your career. However, because joining Fang or other big tech is such a common and desired move, I feel like a lot of people out there actually try to make a brand out of being contrarian and deliberately tell you that going and joining big tech is a really bad idea. The reality is that for something as multifaceted and personal as what job you should take, there is no clear cut answer for everyone. However, I still feel very confident that working at a large VC backed tech company is the best option for the vast majority of people. In this video, I want to talk about some of the common reasons that people reject big tech and why I think they're misguided. And I'm not trying to be a big tech apologist or a big tech crony. Clearly, I thought that there was an opportunity compelling enough for me to leave Facebook. But I do just want to share my perspective here because I think a lot of the guidance or information out there about why not to join big tech is clearly not correct. And I just want to make sure that people hear both sides of the story before they make up their mind. And a quick note of clarification, when I talk about big tech, I'm not just referring to FANG companies, which are probably the most famous examples of big tech, but I'm referring to any large product focused tech company. The first reason people say that they would never want to work at big tech is because the interview process is really long and painful. And I'm the first to admit that the interview process, which typically consists of data structure and algorithm interviews, DSA questions if you're an engineer, it really is contrived in the sense that you typically on the job, you won't actively be using a binary search tree or a linked list. And people use that as a reason to say, hey, I would never work at big tech because they're making me jump through all these hoops. Before I address the actual critique, I wanna make a meta point first, which is that it feels odd to me to dislike X when really you only hate the process of getting into X especially in this case, right? Where the process of getting into FANG or big tech is short and unpleasant. And I'll be the first to admit that it is unpleasant, but the outcome of actually getting into this big tech company is actually quite large and substantial. You have really um, high compensation, you have really talented coworkers, and it'll unlock a lot of future opportunity for you. And so it feels short-sighted to me to reject a whole category of really compelling career opportunities only because you hate the process of getting into that. Talking about the actual interview process, I can understand the annoyance of having to go back and learn um, data structures or algorithms, or maybe you have to learn them for the first time. However, there are two reasons why I do think it's valid. Number one is fairness. I think we can all agree that it's better to use that as a standardized way of measuring competency rather than if you happen to know some particular keyboard shortcut or if you happen to know a programming language or a framework that the company happens to be using today, this month or this year. That stuff is changeable. It'll evolve over time. But what doesn't evolve is the fundamentals of software engineering and programming. And when you want to hire at scale, you want to interview dozens or hundreds of candidates every month or every year, you really want to have a standardized yardstick or standardized way of measuring across all of these different people. The other benefit for using the classic DSA approach to interviewing is that there's a purity to them that you don't really get with alternative forms of evaluation. And what I mean by that is that the best way to get better at data structures and algorithms is just to do more problems of that type. So it's kind of like running a marathon. If I told you you have to go run a marathon by next year, I can guarantee that pretty much everyone should be able to run a marathon there's no secret or there's no real magic behind it. Just put on your running shoes and go run every single day and eventually you'll be able to run that marathon. And in the same way, um, if you wanna get better at DSA or these leak code style questions, just do a bunch of leak code every single day and you'll eventually get to the point where you can start noticing patterns and, and pass these interviews with a lot more confidence. Another very common concern with working at a big tech company is that the work-life balance is terrible. And this is just generally not true. The work-life balance for engineers at big tech companies is actually phenomenal and you're rarely required to put in more than 40 hours a week unless there's like some really major product launch that's happening or if you're really gunning for that promotion then you can maybe expect to put in a little bit extra effort of course there is some variability depending on your team and your company i think in general amazon and facebook have longer work hours from what i've heard compared to microsoft and google um, but in general no matter where you are in big tech, the average workload is gonna be lower compared to the alternative. One reason for a really healthy work-life balance in general at these big tech companies is that very few things are actually truly urgent or make or break in the sense that these companies are quite established and they will easily be able to survive a delay in a product launch or even the cancellation of a product launch. Another reason is that software engineers in particular have the luxury of being much more flexible than other job functions. 
especially with COVID, a lot of these big tech companies are okay with engineers working when they want, how they want, and where they want. Finally, big tech companies in general have a really, really amazing benefits plan. For example, Facebook had 21 days of PTO or paid time off every year on top of a bunch of national holidays. And there was a joke about this where Mark Zuckerberg, um, he heard about, okay, like what is a typical vacation policy? And someone told him, oh, you know, typical is three weeks. And they intended that to mean, you know, 15 days, like three working weeks. But Mark had never worked at a real company before. And so he basically turned that into 21 days and that just stuck. So now everyone working at Facebook gets 21 days of PTO. And I think Facebook might be a little bit on the more extreme side of that, giving that much PTO. But I think in general, if you look at big tech as a unit compared to pretty much any other tech company or any other uh, type of company in the country, the benefits that you get in terms of medical, uh, parental leave, uh, sick leave, all that, it just blows everyone else out of the water. The third reason people will often reject big tech, which doesn't make sense to me, is that they don't want to be a cog in the machine. And I think there's a couple different ways to interpret this. The first interpretation is that um, these people want to support the underdog. They want to support the small business and not be part of this huge corporate machinery, which can have tens of thousands of people and a market cap of a hundred billion or a trillion dollars or more. This idea of helping the small business sounds good in theory, but the reality is actually much more complicated. The reason these companies are so massive is because typically there's a platform underlying their business model. And a platform means that you're bringing together a producer and a consumer, and the company in the middle is actually providing a bunch of value for both parties. So for example, Amazon, they provide value for the buyer and the seller, they connect them. Uh, Google has an Android operating system, which is a massive platform bringing together developers who want to provide you an app, and then people like us, consumers, who want to download these apps and get value out of them. And so the reason why these companies are massive is because they control these platforms. And so, in fact, the best way to help a small business is probably by working at one of these big companies and making that platform better. Another way to interpret not wanting to be a cog in the machine is that there's a lot of process to follow in big tech. And I think that's true. There's no getting around the fact that if you're doing a product launch or if you're trying to get promoted, the fact of the matter is, is that you're going to have a bunch of different stakeholders, a bunch of different gatekeepers, unless you satisfy all of them, your product probably won't launch or you probably won't get promoted. And it does add a bunch of extra time to whatever you're trying to do. But I actually think that one of the benefits of that is, again, going back to this idea of fairness of standardization. Um, at most well-run tech companies, which most of big tech, I would say in general, they're, they have these well-defined processes that leads to a predictability, which is valuable. It's actually what happens is when you go to these small tech companies that I have found that they become more political and you getting things done depends a lot more on who you know and how you talk to them rather than the actual merits behind your product or your promotion. Finally, a third way to interpret cog in the machine of big tech is that you don't really get to meaningfully innovate or shape the direction of the product. And I think this is a pretty fair critique. If you really wanted to, wanted to go to a place where you could have an idea and then ship it the next day or the next week, a startup is probably a better fit for you because in a big tech company, you will have to get approvals or sign off from leadership or other people involved in the company, right? Um, but I just wanted to make a point here that people will often compare big tech to you know, freelancing or consulting. And I think among those options, um, big tech actually does give you a good amount of agency and ability to shape what you want to work on. Whereas with um, the other options, consulting or freelancing, you're going to be beholden to the client and you're going to have to basically do exactly what they say. So just be clear about what options you're comparing. Finally, the fourth reason why people often reject big tech is because these jobs are often located in high cost of living areas like the Bay Area, New York, or Seattle. And even if they get paid more, they just don't want to go to these big metropolitan areas. First, I want to make the point that I think a lot of these big tech companies are actually, with COVID, they have embraced remote work in a much more meaningful way than they have in the past. And so even if you don't want to move to one of these metro areas, I think there's a ton of opportunity today to do remote work and live in the Midwest or live internationally and still get the benefits of working in big tech. Even if you assume that you had to actually move to this expensive metro area to work in big tech, I still think that for the vast majority of people, it makes sense to actually take that option rather than working at a lower paying job locally. For example, let's assume that you're a 30 year old software engineer living in Michigan and your option is either a well paying job in Michigan of $90,000 a year or coming out to New York and you have a $180,000 a year job because you get a salary and you get 
RSUs or equity in the company. And so now let's assume that your rent is going to be triple. It's going to be a lot more expensive in New York. And actually everything is much more expensive. It is correct that your absolute dollar amount spent and your relative dollar amount spent as a percentage of your income is going to be higher in New York. And that's where I think where people get scared. But you actually still end up pocketing a lot more money in New York compared to the alternative job. And I would argue that that is objectively a much, much better deal. Because number one, you get to save all, all that more money and you can accumulate that over time and that will compound and grow at a faster rate. But you also have a lot more growth opportunity in general by working at one of these big tech companies compared to being a senior staff engineer at a local company. Those are four reasons why people often will claim that they never want to work at big tech. And it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, interview process, work-life balance, cog in the machine, and cost of living. And hopefully this video has shown you at least my perspective on why I feel like there's not as much depth of thinking behind those reasons. And I think it does beg the question, why do people leave big tech? And I think there are a ton of reasons. And clearly I left a couple months ago. Um, and I think, you know, everyone has their own reasons, but a lot of them include wanting to work on your own thing. Uh, wanting more financial upside um, or just hitting the reset button where you know you feel like you've gotten to a point in your career where you can take a break and a lot of people just uh, want to have the opportunity to not have a job at all and so I think there are a ton of reasons but I feel like in general for most people starting off their career working at a medium or large tech company is a really great move and the question in some ways shouldn't be why should you work at big tech it should almost be, why shouldn't you work at big tech? And then you can start to backtrack from there. Hopefully this was helpful no matter where you are in your career journey. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.